Guys, what's up? We're in uh, Idaho, hanging out with the homie Clay Hayes, season eight, a lone winner. That's what probably most people introduce you as. But I'm introduced you as a badass real bow hunter. So that's like self bows, stick bows, like trad life, like real bow hunting. And a family man and a guy who uh, gets after it. So welcome to the podcast, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for letting us invade your space. I like in-person podcasts way more. Got a boxer dog. What's your dog's name? That's Lily. Lily. I grew up with boxers. Yeah. Yeah. My mom, my mom raised quite a few litter. They're good dogs. Yeah. She's pretty smart. How old is she? I think she's nine. She's getting up there. Yeah. Yeah. They're good. Rigged. Getting a little gray face. Yeah. They're always excited. So man, like you won alone. I did. Yep. So you should be retired, right? Like <laughs> that's what I, it's amazing. How many comments I've got like that. Oh man, you're set now. I just want to know how much does the government take out? They take a, a third of it. Yeah. So the government was stoked that you won. Oh yeah. Yep. So there's that. And then you clear that, or, you know, and then you're in a different category. You probably weren't in. So there's just certain limitations. So more money, more problems. Uh, but I really like your story. Like uh, wildlife biologist mm -hmm. by trade for Idaho Fish and Game, working on habitat. We'll get into that. Uh, decided to take the leap and try doing like this digital era thing where like you do YouTube and quit your stability every two weeks paycheck yep. to go do what you really wanted to do. Man, are you crazy? I quite possibly yes. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was a. It wasn't a hard decision for me, but it was a, it, it, it definitely like when I went in to give my notice, my heart was pounding. I mean, it was in my throat, but it was like, man, once I did that and I walked out of that office after giving my two weeks note or yeah, after giving my notice, it was like I was free. It's like, that is a feeling that, uh, is indescribable really. Mm. Like I can do whatever I want to. <laughs> you didn't grow up in Idaho. No, no. I grew up in Northwest Florida. Um, grew up on a, a, a ranch. My dad's a cutting horse trainer. So I grew up riding horses, dealing with cows. We raised bison when I was a kid. Uh, my, my parents sold uh, bison meat. So I grew up on that stuff and grew up at a time when Northwest Florida, at least our part was a very rural area it's been kind of co-opted into pensacola now it's a big there's houses and people everywhere now but when i was a kid it was all pine forest bob white quail cottontails and uh just big open country and i had lots of lots of land i could roam around on and spend time in the in the swamps and be a feral kid feral kids where it's at Absolutely. there's not enough of them anymore it's a dying breed yeah which is scary well, we, uh, we give ours free reign, so they're, they're pretty doggone feral. We have yeah. to make them take a shower. They, they come in the house, and their feet are black, and all. <laughs> it's like, dude, you got you to gotta get in the shower before you get in bed. <laughs> that's, that's fair. Uh, how old were you when you finally came out and visited out west? First time I ever went west was I was probably 13, 14, something like that. Um, and I can't remember if it was Pueblo, Colorado, or Gillette, Wyoming, but we went out for the high school rodeo finals, the national high school rodeo finals. I, I, um, I made finals in uh, the cutting, uh, which if you're not familiar with cutting, you just have to Google it. Um, it's a judged event. It's not like, you know, uh, roping or riding bulls or anything, any of the other rodeo events that you'd normally it's be. Subjective. Be, be uh, familiar with yeah but yep uh went out for the the high school rodeo finals and fell in love with it knew that this is where i needed to be and so um went to uh, went to college for natural resources wildlife sciences ended up getting a master's from mississippi state and then once i graduated with that we uh liz and i loaded up everything we owned which all fit in the back of a half ton pickup and we drove to Idaho. Idaho of all places. Yep. Did you have a job lined out or you just drove to Idaho? We had, I first came out um, f to Idaho for a temporary job, temporary technician. 
So we came out, had a six months job, worked the summer, went back to Florida for that winter and then came back out the next year and then got hired on as a, a permanent technician, which then I got, uh, took a promotion into a wildlife biologist and that was in 2009 or 10. I can't remember. Mm. It must've been 10. Cause that's when we moved up here. We were in Southeast Idaho around Idaho falls. Um, but then moved up here near Lewiston, uh, in 2010, I think. You met Liz in college. You guys grow high school sweethearts. How'd you guys meet? Yeah, we, uh, we, we started dating in high school. So we've been together since we were 17. Dang. Yeah. She grew up, um, you know, I don't know, 10 miles down the road. Yep. That's cool. You guys got two boys. Yeah. Koi and Finn, 10 and 13. Finn is, uh, he's, he's running around here somewhere. He, I'm sure you get to see him. Um, Koi's still sleeping, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Finn's the hunter. Uh, Koi doesn't really care about it. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't really care to get out there. He likes to hike and backpack and stuff like that. Likes to fish, but doesn't really care about the hunting. Uh, Finn actually does like his, when I have him on a bow hunting video, like they do way better than mine. <laughs> he's got yeah. a, he did a, uh, we went down to South Florida, uh, this past year and, uh, got to hunt with my buddy, Scott Crippen down there. And it, Finn ended up shooting two pigs with his little bow right there with the, the red and white fletchings on it, little sinew back dosage bow and smacked two pigs with it. And he shot one right out from underneath me. I was, I was sitting there waiting for this pig. He, Finn's sitting on the ground and I'm standing up and there's palm you know, palm fronds everywhere. I'm waiting for this pig to clear a palm frond. And all of a sudden I hear swack. <laughs> and he shot this pig before I ever got a shot. I was like, you little turd. Love it. <laughs> Good job, Finn. No, that's cool. It's a wildlife biology master's degree. We were kind of joking earlier, but like there's a lot of newer hunters coming to the scene, adult onset, maybe from COVID. Maybe it's just because we have a lot of human beings and urban sprawl. I don't care why, but your phone probably rang a lot with the same dumbasses asking the same dumbass questions. Where should I go hunting? You're the biologist, oh, yeah, right? Dude. So at, uh, when I was working for fish and game, there's, um, all of the biologists have to rotate through the front office. Like one day a month, you, you got to spend in the front office, answering phones, answering people's questions and stuff like that. And, Fun. <laughs> um, and so, you know, in August you start, if, if that's, you get it, you get your days in August, September, then you start getting those calls and you'll get, you'll, you'll get 50 calls a day. And, and it's the same call 50 times a day. You know, sometimes you'll get a guy that calls and he's done his research. And he's saying, you know, I'm interested in going into this drainage or th like, what's the elk population doing in this unit? He's got specific questions, you know, that, that guy you can help. Like you can answer that guy's questions. Like, okay. You know, you know if I've ever been in, if he's asking about a specific drainage, if I've ever been in there, I'll say, yeah, you know, you can expect this type of stuff or whatever, or you can answer questions about elk population trends and things like that. Um, but the guy that calls and say, Hey, going to, I'm thinking about going to Idaho, just looking for a place to go. It's like, I can't help that guy because I get that call 50 times a day and I don't have a thousand different places that I can send people. You know, I can make general recommendations like, okay, what type of hunt do you want to do? Like, are you, are you wanting to do a 10 day back country backpacking trip? Are you looking to car camp? Are you like, what's your physical abilities? How much effort do you want to put into it? That type of stuff. And I can kind of give them some general ideas, but I can't like, I can't tell them to go, you know, I can't give them a GPS location. <laughs> no, you cannot. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so guys listening, if that is you biologist, and there's difference, like in Idaho, you guys had like habitat biologists like yourself, but then you had like populations biologists too, right? That do the aerial surveys yep. and the studies and the objectives and calf counts and collaring animals. And, you know, there's some good questions to ask, like once you've done your prerequisite homework, yep. um, and really start picking the brains of the biologists. Once you know, kind of the lay of the land, 
hey, is this road open? I was thinking about hitting this trailhead, and here was my strategy. Yep. It's going to bugle here, camp here. Have you seen any elk feed on this feature? What is, like, the fringe food? Like, get into the, the – ask them the biology questions. I'm sure you guys have tons of information. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you just got to do your research. And there's a lot of information in the, the elk management plans, too. I mean, all of the units are broken down in there. They all have – cow calf bull ratios um and then there's tons of harvest statistics on the uh on the internet so there's lots of information out there to be had yeah did you ever get involved in the surveying uh or the aerials or i did i've done some aerial surveys i didn't like doing it because it's incredibly dangerous i mean you're it's high risk flying because you're flying very very low oftentimes you're flying you know in in trees basically yeah. um and it's the number one killer of wildlife biologists so it's not something i wanted to be doing but yeah. i mean it's, i did it when i was younger it's fun it's really fun to do you know when you're out on winter range and there's three thousand elk in a herd and you're breaking them apart and counting groups of them and pushing you know it's it's fun but it's also very dangerous mm, yeah that makes sense the Panhandle, Northern Idaho, doesn't have an objective for elk, which has always been kind of like, I've never understood why, other than that maybe it's just impossible for them to know their numbers because of the way that it's the land features, the topography, the timber. Um, did you ever get hear the reasons why? No, I, I don't have any idea. Um, I worked in the Clearwater region, and it's it might it may have something to do with the – how they do their surveys or how the um how the topography and the cover affects their ability to do surveys i don't really know like when i was doing the surveys i was in sa southern idaho where, where their winter range is wide open i mean yeah. it's sagebrush and maybe what some area juniper. specifically in southeast idaho where you i in? was uh so i was the senior tech at Tex Creek Wildlife Management Area, which okay. is a big winter range, a uh, little south east of Idaho Falls. Yep. And there's there was at least when I was there, I don't know what the populations are now, <clears throat> but when I was there, there were gobs and gobs of elk. And I mean, it's it's a cool area. Mm, yeah, there's a that area got hit pretty hard with snow this year. And south of there in Utah mm -hmm. and Wyoming, that whole little like triangle in there. I'm wondering how those elk numbers are doing. I kind of pay attention to yeah. the snowpacks. It's, we'll see. Uh, how long have you been elk hunting, man? First season was probably 2008 or nine. I can't remember exactly, but um, it took me a long time to kill an elk with a bow. I killed a few with, a, with my flintlock there those first couple of years, but uh, I don't think I killed an elk for like with a bow for maybe six or seven seasons. Yeah. And I mean, I made some, like if I, it, I had some great opportunities. Oh. Like if I knew what I know now and yeah. could go back then and have some of those same opportunities, I could have killed elk every year, but they were just, I mean, I grew up in the Southeast hunting whitetails and our whitetails, I mean, I'm, I'm talking Florida whitetails. So like a, a mature doe might be 80 pounds, you know, mature buck. The first deer I ever shot, was a five and a half year old uh, four by four. We called him an eight point down there. And he dressed out at 98 pounds. So I grew up on these things. I mean, they're like dogs. And then to come out West and to be close to an animal that's five, six, maybe 700 pounds. That's like a freaking horse, man. And it, they were just intimidating. Um, and I was hunting them like white tails like being super like it um you know if a white tail a white tail might um catch a glimpse of you and you might not spook it off but if they are even the least bit curious about something about you like they're never going to let you get drawn on them you're never going to be able to draw on that deer and i was the same i was just too timid about them i wasn't aggressive enough with the elk i didn't know what i could get away with and now I think I've pretty well got it figured out. Like, I mean, you can be pretty damn aggressive with elk. Like, I, I walk through the woods just intentionally breaking stuff. Um, and a lot of times you can walk right up on them. Yeah, it's a huge, huge feature at the camps we do is 
Like you're not whitetail hunting. No. And it's the, a lot of these guys from the Midwest and the East are coming out West and it's a different mindset. Uh, there is no sneaking. And if you're sneaking, you're a predator. If you're a yeah. predator, they're not going to have tolerance, but if you're loud and obnoxious, you're going to have a chance. And then the amount of crap you can get away with, especially if like a cow or an elk of just any type of bull is maybe picked you off and you just happen to vocalize a little with a cow call or something while you're drawing your bow back and they watch you draw your bow back. It's incredible. You would never get away with that with a white tail. No, right. Mm -mm. Uh, I, th I definitely think people err on the side of passive passivity versus being aggressive with elk. And that's why the learning curves are long. Mine was two. Mine was uh, five minutes in Washington killed him with a rifle. Wanted to get a bow. Yeah. Because they bugle, right? So I got a bow in 2002. And I went to Idaho from 2002. And it wasn't until 2009 that I killed my first Idaho bull with a bow. Now, I had some success in New Mexico. I put an asterisk next to that because it's not North Idaho. It's... It's, it wasn't where at my home elk turf, I killed a couple bulls in Montana, but man, I'm telling you right now, like 2002 to 2009 was that's seven years of pounding the brush, not killing a bull. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because of opportunity It's because I knew how to make every mistake. Yep. And I wouldn't trade, honestly, I wouldn't trade those years for anything. It's made me the hunter I am today. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I put in a lot of miles, uh, a lot of sore feet and had some amazing experiences yeah i mean some of the some of the best experiences i had elk hunting happened during that time i never got to draw my bow but i i mean like one uh one experience that i constantly remember is i was probably had been elk hunting for maybe three years and had i was up on a ridge and had seen a cow or a, uh, a bull and maybe five or six cows in this valley below me it was late in the evening. So the next morning I got up on there, they were back in there. I just caught the tail end of the last cow going up into the timber. Yep. So I hustled down there, got on their trail and tracked them. Uh, they had gone through a Creek and they splashed mud all everything. So I tracked them for like four hours yep. until like, I don't know, 11 o'clock and, uh, figured they were bedded somewhere. So I just kind of chilled, pulled out my, uh, lunch out of my pack and started eating lunch and from not far 70 yards away maybe just over a knoll i hear a bugle i mean they were right there i didn't know it but i crept up to this thing and i could see this bull he's a nice bull uh but he was running his cows around you know doing all of the the herd behavior stretching his neck out and checking cows and this and that and i had a cow come up the ridge and come walking straight to me and dang near step on me. I mean, she stopped and was looking down at me. And I'm, I'm kind of like hunkered down with my bow. And she caught me off guard. She came over my right shoulder and I was like facing this way. So I couldn't have, I couldn't turn to shoot. So I had to just sit there. And she eventually, she looked at me for, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds like that. And spooked and wheeled and ran off but didn't bark. And when she did that, the bull come charging up the hill and he stopped just on the other side of a little fir tree that was eight yards away, bugling. Mm -hmm. I mean, when when a when an animal that big bugles that close to you, it's like you it vibrates your, your chest. Yep. And that was like one of the really one of the first really close encounters I had with a big bull, and I I'll remember that till the day I die. You will. Yeah. Yep. I got several of those types of stories, and it's it does something to you. Well, I'm obsessed with elk hunting. It's oh, my I North Star, it. man. Yep. Um, I mean, I love hunting, but no elk is what would keep our eyes on the prize. I love it and I hate it. it <laughs> it's tough and it's getting harder. We kind of talked about this off camera a little bit, but like, you know, we're going to get into the YouTube thing a little bit. Um, I love YouTube. I hate YouTube, just like elk hunting. I love elk hunting. I hate elk hunting. Uh, but I like things that are hard. I'm drawn to things that are challenging. That's elk hunting for sure. There's a ton of physicality and more mentality, in my opinion, elk hunting. Uh, you just got to be kind of tough or really lucky. But if you're tough and a little lucky, man, sky's the limit. Now, same with YouTube. You've been doing YouTube for how long? I think I, think I put my first video up in 2008 or nine. You yeah, somewhere right in there. You haven't given notice yet? Hmm? You hadn't given two weeks notice yet. You're, oh, no, no, no. This, that was way before. You got a real job. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, 
I like making bows. I'm going to, I'm going to put a video up of me making my bow. Yep. Yeah. That, I, I started making YouTube videos, um, just on bow making. Um, not, didn't have any inclination that you could make money doing it. I just enjoyed the creative process of it, the process of it. And, uh, I like making bows and I like teaching people how to make bows. And so that was a perfect platform for doing that. Mm. Yeah. So fast forward, I think you said it best earlier, but like at some point it caught on, like yeah, people were noticing you're growing a platform, you're growing a community. Yeah. I, so I, I started with the bow building video, started doing some bow hunting type stuff, did a film, like my first, what I call a film, uh, premiered at the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous in Denver. That was in 2013. And that's when it really kind of started picking up a little bit. I started doing an educational series with BHA called Backcountry College, just random outdoor stuff, how to build a fire in the rain, how to tie knots, how to lift a bag, you know, for a bear hang, that type of stuff. Um, and I started making a little bit of money at it. Um, and then by the time 2017, came along almost 10 years after I started. Um, I got to the point where I was making fair, a fair bit of money, but I was only spending maybe 5% of my time. The YouTube thing is what I really wanted to be doing. And so I, I, I knew that I could make it. Like if I invested all my time in it and really gave it a go, I knew that I could make it. But, you know, making that decision to do that it made Liz super nervous because it meant like to take that leap meant that we had no insurance. We had no steady paycheck coming in. It gave up all of our security. Like we had no, nothing to fall back on really. And, um, but I knew that even if it, the YouTube thing didn't work out, like I could make a living doing something. I can build barns. I could do something to make, I'm like, we're not going to lose the house, you know? And so in, uh, in the fall of 2017, I walked in to my supervisor office, gave my two weeks notice and then walked out. Like I said earlier, I walked out of that office and I was free and it was, you know, it, my heart was in my throat when I went in there to give my notice, but it's like joy <laughs> when you, when you finally do it and you walk out and you're like, holy cow, man, I, I can do whatever I want. I am totally free. Mm, that's powerful. And there's a lot of people that envy that or at least look up to that or would potentially even be willing to, to hear this and, and go for it themselves. So do you have words of advice? What have you learned along this journey? I don't think you went to business school. No. And there's some business involved by be, I'm going to call you an influencer because that's kind of what you are. And I hate that word. Despise it. But what best practices? What have you learned, man, from the business side of things? Well, when you, when you go out on your own like this, like there's no, the, the biggest challenge is that there's no like pre worn in career path. It's like, you don't know, like everybody that does this, does it differently. And so you, ha you can't like look at this guy and say, okay, I'm going to do it this way. Or if I, if I work like at this job, I'm going to get this promotion. Then I can do this. And this leads to this. Like, no, there's none of that. There's none of that. And it's like, I describe, like I've tried so many different things that just don't go anywhere. Um, and I, I describe it as like, have you ever been in a, you ever been in a deep cave where you like, you can't see your face. Like there's some lava tubes in South Idaho where you can get back in there and you can't, there is no light. And it's like being in that you have no, concept of where to go and you're like feeling your way around this dark cave looking for an opening and you might feel like a little recess and you you might explore that sure. and it may go somewhere and it may not but you got to check it out and eventually you know you can kind of find a direction that works for you and that's what i've done like i've i mean like i said i've tried all all kinds of stuff that doesn't work and you got to figure out what works for you and what you're comfortable doing um and what allows you to be genuine. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no, there's no like career path that goes along with this, <clears throat> but as far as like taking the leap and doing it, um, you, you're never going to be ready. I don't think to do that. Like you're never going to be 
at least I wasn't. Uh, I just knew that I could do it. Um, and it really took some convincing for Liz because she was super nervous about it. Um, but eventually, you know, she figured that it was actually working and, and got behind it a hundred percent. And she does all the business stuff. Now she does all the, she takes care of all the stuff that I don't like doing. <laughs> yeah. My wife does the same thing. I, uh, she was a nurse for forever. And then, um, honestly, the main reason she stopped being a nurse was like, I noticed like the day she'd go to the hospital we have two little ones, a six and eight year old. They're not little anymore, but, um, man, like it kind of put a big dent in my ability to do elk shape all day. Cause it just, I got to get them ready for school. I got to take them to school. I got to make their lunches. It doesn't sound hard, but, and then also just keep track of things. And then she didn't get home till late. They, a lot of nurses work 12 hour shifts. So I'm taking the kids, getting them home from school, making them dinner. Like I'm just not doing elk shape basically. And it just came to a point where I was like, you hate going like she worked on a shitty floor at the hospital it was mm -hmm. neuro. So it was like spinal surgeries or like major head trauma. And it's always men. They get head trauma. And we as men turn into cavemen when we have major head trauma. Like, so just I'm going to leave it at that, but just horrible stories of just guys that I would like, literally, I would not allow them to do whatever they did. But, and you know, she loved her coworkers and stuff, but it's like, it came to a point. I was like, I don't like you working. You don't like working and you could help me with the business stuff, which is code for you can deal with all the business stuff and I can just make content. Yep. And she's like done. And she just told me the other day, she's like, Hey, it's, it's coming up on a year. Like, uh, if I'm going to be a nurse, I gotta keep my license. I gotta like start working again. And I was like, well, do you want to do nursing? She's like, no. And I was like, sweet, done deal. Like you're not a nurse anymore. Like let your license expire. The same story with us. Liz was, um, she was in uh, x-ray. So she did that. And um, same, same exact, exact story. It's cool to work with your spouse or whatever. And honestly, my wife does not even hardly work with me. She's always doing what she wants to do. You mm -hmm. know what she wants to do? Gardening. Yep. Um, a home and garden TV projects on our house. Like that's where all my money goes, man. To like, I was told, I just literally said this to Tyler, the camera guy over here, my buddy. I was like, Alicia will need the truck today because she will be going to the hardware store because she goes to the hardware store every day, but she's happy. I'm happy. And that's cool that you guys are doing that. Let's talk about the catalyst. Um, because I don't want people to just give alone all the credit for your success. Um, prior to alone, when I met you, you weren't at hundred K subs, but you were getting close. Because uh, Joel, I met you, Joel, and my buddy Cote, and they're like, oh, man, you should check out his YouTube channel. He's got a YouTube. I did. And it was like, at the time, I was probably like at 20K subs. And I was like, oh, shit, this guy's like get inches away to 100. I'll got to check this dude out. And um, I asked you when I got here, where are you at, subs? And you're like, 320K. That's a huge, There's that's a, that's a game changer, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and not the monetary, like the monetization and, and ads. People think you make so much money off that, whatever, but it's really pennies on the dollar. If you're going to run that program, it's the things that surround the platform, right? Yeah. Um, your cadence is one video a week. Yeah. That's so much work to me. That's yeah, but it's, work. it's stuff that I like doing and that, that I would be doing anyway, you know, so it's not, you know, I don't, I have a pretty good job. You self film most of this. <laughs> most of it. Yeah. My oldest boy, uh, does some filming for me. Um, I'm trying to get him interested in, in the cameras and that, that, that would be cool. Uh, and then Finn, my youngest boy, he's riding his bicycle around here. He'll go like actually, you know, hunting and doing the stuff like that, but he doesn't do any of the camera work or anything like that. Yeah. So I'd say not, yeah, 90, 95% of the filming that I do, I do myself though. You edit yourself. Yep. yep. And you told me this funny story where I'm like, cause dude, you're hard to get a hold of like cell phone server. I just turned my phone off. I can't get no service where you live. But like I was telling Tyler, I was like, yeah, I got to coordinate when I talk to Clay. Like he's got to go to a special spot, stand on one leg to talk on a phone. So you don't have cell service. So I'm like, how the hell are you uploading videos? What were you doing living out in the boondocks uploading? I think that's hilarious. Yeah. So um, I think we've had like actual internet for maybe two years. 
so pre previous to that, we ran our whole business off our cell phones, but cell phone service sucks here. And so to upload a video, what I'd have to do is I'd have to take like a hundred yards of extension cord and run it up the hill till I could see a cell tower, set up a tent. Pretty sure it's more than a hundred yards. That's, <laughs> that's a hill. Put my, uh, put my laptop, couldn't, you know, connect the, the personal hotspot to my laptop in the tent and let it run overnight. It would still take, you know, 18 hours to upload a video. Oh my God. <laughs> How happy were you when you finally got internet? It's pretty cool to be able to sit in the bedroom and like have internet and upload a video without having to freaking go set up a tent and a, a hot spot Dude, up on the hill. I tip my that's commitment right there. What about filming cameras and stuff? Like, do you know stuff about cameras or are you pretty raw? Have you learned over the years? Um, I know enough to do what I do. Uh, I just I I filmed with uh, Canon DSLR for a long time. And just this last year, just switched to the Sony's. You did, you yeah. Made the switch. Oh man, it's uh, and they're nice. Like everything about, I like everything about them. What Sony's did you end up rolling with? The A seven S, maybe. Yep. Is that it? Is that yep. right? Yeah. I remember switching from Canon to Sony quite a few years ago, and there was a learning curve, man, for sure. But now you hand me a Canon DSLR, foreign language. Yep. I don't even know how to. Um, <laughs> Sony's are rad, except for the, the overheat. Uh, yeah, so speaking of, like, I was kind of asking you if you knew much about filming, but I'll be honest with you, as a fan of this, the show alone, before you were ever on there, I've, lo I've always loved that show. It's something my wife and I always watch, and it's just unique. It's a cool, it's self-filmed by the contestants. Mm -hmm. And I did watch your season, and you got a lot of airtime, and I remember telling my wife, I'm like, Clay's YouTube days have really catapulted him. He is on the show more than the other contestants because he's doing a freaking awesome rad job at filming his experience. Yeah. That's what stood out to me. Yeah, and that's one of the things like, uh, you know, you can watch the show and some people just don't have much airtime, even though they were doing stuff because they just like the filming just didn't jive with them. You know, and some people enjoy the process. Some people it's just a burden on them. Uh, for me, I like filming to get a good shot on film to me is like, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think the filming prior to being on the show really helped me anyway. Yeah. You killed it. So you won season eight, mm -hmm. you were in the bush for 74 days, plus all the nonsense leading up to it, the training, the lockdown, it was during COVID. Yeah. Um, and maybe we'll have to give more context to the show for those that don't know, but um, I don't feel like it's a spoiler alert now because they're on what season? This will be 10 coming up. Yeah, maybe? 10's coming or up. 11? So I don't remember. What can you describe the feeling when they surprised you with your wife, assuming that's real? So they, that's the only thing, like every other season, um, the spouse has got to come out there. We did ours right in the middle of COVID. They wouldn't let her come. They wouldn't let Liz come up there. Man. Um, and so they had to, they told me themselves. Um, but I, I don't know, man. You can look at the, you can watch those final scenes in that season and see the emotion that's coming, you know, across. I'm not an, I'm not usually a very emotional person, but that was very emotional for me. Um, and there's a, there, if you watch closely, if you watch my facial expression, when they first kind of broke the news, I was like, N -n -n I couldn't, un I didn't really understand what they were saying because for so long, like I, the, if you allow yourself to start hoping that the next time you see them, you're going to go home with them, like it's going to be over. If they come out and you, and it's not over, that can be crushing. And so I, I was guarding myself against that because they come out for these, they come out for med checks per periodically. If you're not familiar with the show, like how, how often it depends on for us anyway, it depended on the time of season, the, the, the duration or, uh, the time during the time that we were out there. That doesn't really make sense. But when we were there early, the, 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 um, intervals were fairly long. Yeah, like, so you, like, they drop you <coughs> off, like, 
I'm going to just guess, but it looks like sep- end of September, October-ish. Yeah, so they dropped us off September 18th. And I think the longest I ever went without seeing anybody, if I remember correctly, was about three weeks. But as the Damn. season... It's pretty long. <laughs> as the season goes farther, they start coming more often because people's body condition starts to deteriorate. And so they, the, the doctor has, just has to keep closer tabs on you. And so towards the end of it, they were coming every seven days or so. And so there at the end, if you, you know, if it's getting, it's getting on up there, you know, it's getting 65, 70 days and they, they say, okay, we're coming for a med check. And it's during those times when they're, they're, they're going to tell you that you're the last one. So you say, oh man, like, this is it. Like they're coming to tell me I won. And if they come and do the med check, all that stuff, and then they leave, it's like, can you imagine, you know, the, 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 that would be crushing for you. No, I couldn't imagine. And so, it's tough, man. And so I, I guarded myself against that. Like I, I totally took that whole scenario out of my mind. Like it's, this is not possible that they're coming to tell me that I, that I am the last one. And so it was, that was not a part of my like being. And so when they told me that, when they broke the news, it was like, I was like legitimately confused as to what they were trying to tell me. And it wasn't until they said, you're the last one that it sunk in. I was like, holy, sh- holy crap. I, I did it. Like I'm going home. And that was my first thought. It wasn't about the money. No, it was definitely it was like, go I'm going home. Family. Yeah. I'm going home to see my family. Yeah. Incredible. So you just kind of answered a question that I was totally convinced otherwise, but I guess I'm going to, I'm going to just break it down for you. How, what cameras are on your persons as a contestant? So they give you a Canon um, camcorder. Yeah. It's okay. one of the bigger, like a prosumer type camcorders. So you got that. You got a small little JVC. You got maybe th- three, two or three GoPros um, and a bunch of batteries. Yeah, like a shitload of batteries, right? Ton, ton of batteries, because they and and media cards. Like, I mean, yeah. they give you limitless, right? Because really, yeah. I was convinced, Tyler. I might have told you this, but I was convinced from an editorial standpoint, you can't get all this footage after seventy-four days from mm-hmm. how many contestants? Ten. Ten contestants. You, there's not enough time to sort through all this. So I figured they had to be doing not only med checks, but camera, yep. like here's your camera, here's your car, here's your fresh batteries. Oh, and what timestamps or like what highlights did you film so that we can start editing? Is that true or not? Absolutely. You're spot on. So when they come out to do the med checks, they also, they give you fresh batteries and they give you fresh media cards and they take all of your dead batteries and media cards. And, you know, presumably behind the scenes, they, they have someone that's dedicated to each cont- each participant that goes through all their footage. Wow. And I said at one point, I was like, man, whoever has to watch all this crap, I'm going to have to buy you a beer because they're <laughs> literally, I probably gave them 800 hours yep. of footage. Yep. I mean, because there's a lot of times they drill into your head before you go out there. It's like you just, just film everything. Just keep the camera rolling, which is great advice because if you – for those of you who've seen this season, like they said it was day number one, but it was actually day two or three. I'm just sitting around a campfire and a mountain lion comes up behind me. It's like 10 yards. And I was sitting by my campfire, not doing anything. Like I was just sitting there and the camera was rolling. And if the camera wasn't rolling, I never would have got that moment on film. That was, incredible. It was one of the most awesome moments of, of my time there. Probably of the entire I wish you could run of the him. show. Oh, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, yeah. So let's talk about the hunting regulations. Like you were in BC, yep. BC loves their bears, their yep. grizzly bears. They're protected in Alberta. And I've, my last podcast was literally about how grumpy I am about that. But, um, like there's some years seasons where it seems like it's like free reign, kill whatever you want that you need. Um, what was their limitations on yours? Yeah. So, um, you know, they, they have the regulations and you, you got to follow that stuff. So we had, um, on our season, we so at my side I had moose, and had uh, grizzlies, and then um, you know of course mountain lions, and blacktail deer. The only thing so moose were off limits. Of course grizzlies were off limits. 
Uh, the only big game that we could hunt were, were deer. And of course and they, they would allow us to hunt cats, which was, it, it, you know, for somebody to kill a cat with a bow would be very unlikely. Um, so I was, when they, when they told us, congratulations, you can hunt cats. I was like, well, okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> I never thought I'd see one, but I, you know, Golly. of course, day two or three, I, you know, I had that opportunity, thought about it later. Um, I ended up trying, my bow was back at my tent, like 20 yards away. So I tried to slip back and grab my bow Yeah. and I should have, what I should have done was just rush to that cat. Tree it, right? Yep. I should have rushed it when it was so close and then ran and got my bow. But you know, it's never, that didn't, didn't cross my mind during that mm. time. Yeah, that's a bummer, man. I'd really like to have, like, to me, you did kill a deer. Yep. How many? Just one? Yeah, you just got one deer. I couldn't, that's all you were allowed. Oh, God. Did not know that. Okay, so you got one deer now, so that's that's not going to sustain you. So you, how did you butcher it? How did you, like, space out the meat? How did you procure the meat? Like, what did you do, man? Yeah, so when I, when I killed that deer, it was, uh, I don't remember what day it was, but it was warm. I mean, it probably had gotten up to 80 degrees that day. And so, you know, you're in an area that has an incredibly high grizzly density. It's warm, there's flies. Um, and so I, you know, I quartered it up, put all the meat in, um, like all the odds and ends, back straps, uh, liver, all of that stuff in the hide and bundled it up. Uh, didn't have a pack or anything. Right. So you're carrying all this stuff. I think I had about a two mile hike back to, camp and so i i took all the meat and like leapfrogged it and just kind of leapfrogged it in, in in stages all the way back to my camp hung it up for that night and then i think i hung it for like three days because i needed to build a smokehouse to cure the meat out so i spent like three days building a smokehouse and then cut all the meat into little strips little jerky strips basically and i I, I smoked that entire deer. I kept the uh, I kept the shanks whole and smoked them whole. Um, and one of those shanks I kept all the way until Thanksgiving Day, and I cooked that shank on Thanksgiving Day. No salt, no preservatives, no nothing. Just smoked over an alder alder fire for three days. It was freaking awesome. That's badass, man. No, you really like proved your metal, like. Did you, did you impress yourself at all along the way? Did you know your ability? Did you feel like you like kind of, what was your mindset? Just day by day. I mean, I don't know. You, you, you don't, you, tr I, I tried to avoid anyway, trying to like, I never thought about how much, de how much is, uh, I didn't even keep track of the time. I didn't know how many days I was there. I didn't care. I, I, before I ever went in there, I made the commitment that I was not coming out voluntarily. Um, so the only two ways for me to come out of there was to either be the last one or for them to pull me out medically. I was in the head space to, I was in the right frame of mind to do that and to push your body to that limit, you know, and you, they, they let you get pretty run down before they'll pull you out medically. Hmm. Um, I mean, there's been seasons in the past where guys have gotten very, very, very skinny. How was the recovery process uh, and transitioning back to real life after the season? Um, it was it was interesting coming out of the woods because you don't have any you'd have no they don't give you any information. They don't tell you what day it is. They don't tell you what's going on in the world. You don't have any idea what's going on with your family when you're out there. And so, um, all of this was like COVID blew up while I was out there. I had no idea what was going on in the world. And so coming out, you know, you're getting all of this information. Um, and it was interesting getting it from the, from the Canadian perspective, you know? Um, but they, as far as like nutrition and stuff like that, they have your meals like catered to you, whatever your needs are. So they have a nutritionist there planning out all your meals and, and stuff like that. And so they keep you, it's not like they bring you out of the woods and then like kick you loose. You know, we had to stay, uh, I stayed at the lodge where they were doing all the production stuff for probably 10 more days. 
after I came out and of the woods. And probably some post-production filming and yeah. all that jazz. Yeah, they did some interviews um, and all that stuff. And then uh, at the end of that, put me on an airplane back home. Being in the woods for 74 days and then having a kind of a short transition to be in, then finding yourself in an international airport was pretty crazy because you know, how crazy airports are. And, and, you know, I'd been in the woods and I had, I was like, had no schedule, had, didn't rush to do anything. You know, it's a very simple, very laid back type of a, you know, lifestyle. And then to be in an international airport like that, where there's just chaos, people running around everywhere. It was, that was a very, very strange juxtaposition. Um, but as far as like coming home, some people I, I hear, some people have difficulty with that. Um, for me, it was not, it, it, we, you know, it was just like coming home from a long hunting trip. You know, I jumped right back into everything. Um, with a greater appreciation for family and everything else that you can tend to take for granted for certain because being out there that's one of the th that's one of the great benefits of being out there is it takes away from you everything that you do take for for granted and it gives you a much greater appreciation for that that type of stuff um but uh no it wasn't there was no problems like transitioning back into my everyday life here because I'm used to that. I'm used to going away for, you know, two weeks, three weeks on a hunting trip and then coming back and, you know, just picking up everything. Yeah. I know that life. I, I live that life too. And what you said there about you realize that things you take for granted. I mean, hunting does that for me, but I think obviously to what you did to a higher degree, because yeah. that's a long time by yourself and you are trying to survive straight up. Uh, any motivation to win the money or was it always just about the experience? I never thought about the money at all. I, and, and I've said it before, I would have done it had there not been any money. I would have done it just for the challenge of seeing if I could do it because it's something that it's like the ultimate challenge, you know, for skills that I've tried to develop my whole life. You know, we were talking earlier, I, I, I've been in the woods doing this stuff since I was, you know, eight, 10 years old. Um, and so it's like, now you have this opportunity to actually put all those things to the test and figure out if you're as good as you think you are. Mm -hmm. So now let's fast forward, man. Like here we are present day. Take us through like a average day for you. Like how do you, what's work quote unquote, what's not work. What are you looking forward to? What's your primary objectives, raising family? Like, just take us through it. Okay. For, so, I mean, it's hard to describe an average day because there aren't really any average days. Cause it, you know, I might be on any given day, we might be in the back country backpacking, hunting, uh, or just on a backpacking trip, making content. I might be here in the shop making a bow. I might be back in the woods doing some bushcraft and video or, you know, teaching people how to, tie knots or something like that. Um, and so that's, that's my work. I go and, um, make videos about whatever I happen to be interested in that, that day. Um, and then I come back and, and edit it, uh, and then upload that to YouTube. Um, Liz does all the hard stuff. I mean, she keeps track, of all the money, keeps track of the bills. She, um, you know, we have a, a Patreon site where people can sign up for a couple bucks and get like content that other people don't get. Uh, she keeps track of all of that stuff, does all the, fills all the orders, basically all the like stuff that makes the business run. I just do, you know, I make videos. You're the star <laughs> man. Yeah. So Patreon, I've heard a lot of people doing that. That's essentially a paywall to get more exclusivity on some of the content. Yep. Basically. Um, so the stuff that's on Patreon is like very in depth, detailed bow building. Like I explain every little detail, every pop problem that you could run into when you're building a bow. And there's a lot of them. Um, 
And so that's that's the primary reason folks sign up for that for for my Patreon anyway. Is they're they're super into bow building. That's really cool. And then obviously YouTube monetizing YouTube. I mean, that does help, right? Like it's kind of a nice stream of income, Yep. but it certainly would never pay all your bills. Like you got to do other things. It, I mean, it can, it certainly sure. can. If you've got, if you've got the subscriber base, um, I mean, there's people that make a lot of money on YouTube. I'm not to that level yet. Yeah. I mean, it's just not an audience for a guy who's kind of like you, you know, I mean, maybe there will be, and I hope I certainly pray. I mean, I would love that, but um, you know, we don't make stuff for kids, so we don't have Mr. Beast, yeah. you know, 30 million views in a day type thing. Uh, Logan Paul, very controversial doing stupid stuff. Like that's not like you're adding a lot of value and education as yep. your content cornerstone. Um, so there's other things besides Patreon and YouTube. You work probably with some companies, I would yep. assume. Yep. What are some of the favorite companies you work with? Uh, so Kafaru, First Light, uh, Vortex, those guys, uh, Seek Outside, those guys have been with me for a long time since I think 2000, I did a film in 2015, um, where we did a backcountry mule deer hunt. And that was the first time that I ever really got sponsors. Um, Three Rivers Archery's in there. Um, I think that's all of them. So I'm probably leaving somebody. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, I get it. Um, but, uh, yeah, those guys, uh, you know, it's an endorsement type, type, uh, type deal. But the thing like, especially and first light's a perfect example, like first light just came on as a sponsor well, this last year, but I've been wearing first light stuff for 10 years. Yeah. And so it's like, I get, and I sure, I'm sure you get it too. I get daily, daily, I get a dozen people a day wanting me to pitch some product and I just got one the other day 4000 or $5,000 to pitch some um, it was like a survival food company that was wanting to pay me to integrate a 30 second ad into a video five grand I'm not going to do that because it doesn't fit with my videos I don't know what these I don't it may be crap like I have no idea what this product is. Somebody saying yes, because I am getting the similar amount of e like emails asking for similar type things that you, that are not vetted. And a lot of times, honestly, they don't have no relevancy to the kind of content I'm making. I've got, I've gotten them for mattresses, <laughs> like all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And so somebody's saying yes. Cause they're like, Oh yeah turning and burning and, and that's i'm not i'm not saying that i would never do that like if i had a product that i was familiar with that i liked or that i had some use for maybe i'll do it someday i've never found the situation where i'd feel comfortable doing that and so i'm turning down thousands of dollars a month because i don't want to do that um you know but you still get people like anytime you mention a company or whatever or they see a a sponsor logo on a video you're like oh you sell out it's like dude if you had any idea what kind of money i turned down because i don't want to pitch products that i don't believe in or that i don't use or it has no relevancy to this video you would probably reconsider what you're saying so I don't know. The, the companies i work with are good companies they're they're um you know, there's stuff that I've been using for years. They're well-made. Um, so yeah. Don't sell me. In fact, try to sell me on not doing the kind of work you do for a living. Like what's all the stuff that maybe makes you pause and question what the hell are you even doing? <sighs> Besides comments like that, obviously. I you did? I mean, <laughs> the comments section on YouTube, uh, is like, a free for all, you know, it, it, anybody can post anything up there. And it's all, it's like, it's like that across social media. Um, most of my comments are really good. Every now and then you get somebody that's just like venting or being unreasonable or whatever. I just ignore those. Um, but as far as like, you know, you, you could take those things to heart, I guess, and like allow them, allow people to like run you down. Um, I just choose to ignore them and, you know, I, I picture them as just some sad person that needs this outlet in some way. 
Um, but no, most of my comments are good. As far as like why not to do this, um, it is a hustle. I mean, you got to stay on top of it. It's not like um, if you can't slack off and still get a paycheck. You know, you have to, I have to continuously put out content, which is fine for me because I do the things that I want to do anyway. I'm just, I'm just documenting my life and putting it on YouTube, you know? Um, I, I honestly can't think of one reason why you would not want to do that. Uh, unless you're just, you like the idea of just being able to go to work do your thing and then leave it. Like I'm never not working. If I, you know, I just always, I'm always working, but I, but my work is my life. If that makes sense. It makes sense to me, obviously, cause I'm in similar shoes as you. Um, what's your wife's perspective on you always working? Um, how do you balance that? So that's changed dramatically. So when we, um, when I was working for fish and game and doing the YouTube thing, especially in those last couple of years, right up until I left fish and game, it was, re it was pretty hard on us because I would go to work, you know, for eight, 10 hours a day. And then I would come home and I would be on the computer for another three, four hours. And I was just not, I wasn't interacting. You know, she, you know, Koi, my oldest boy was a toddler at that time. Or, you know, once, I, once it got on up till I quit, he was a little bit older, but like, um, it was very difficult on the marriage because I was not very good at managing my time. I had an idea in what, in my head, what I was trying to build and she couldn't see what I saw. But after I left fish and game, it got a lot better. I mean, it like, it was like, night and day because then I had all the time, you know, we were doing things together and that's one of the good things about what I do is cause we can do like, if we go on a hunting trip, like one of the things we do every year is we do, um, our bow hunting elk camp is we take the whole family. We go set up a big wall tent. We just live at elk camp until I kill something and that might be the whole month and we just live in the mountains and we do that together. Um, so it's been, it's been very good since I quit, but, but before I quit, it was, it was, it was tough there for a couple of years. Mm, I think you answered that really well. Yeah. So Clay, super pumped for you, man. Like you're a hardworking guy, but you're really modest. Like, I'm just gonna give you some observations, first impressions. Like you've set it up to be simple and you and I both know, sim be a simple man. Like that's, that's definitely the way to live. Um, you're a passionate bow builder, like legitimate next level bow building guru. Like this, you're the guy and it's incredible. This shop, what you do. Wow. So the Patreon might just be worth its while for those that are maybe having some interest, but start at the beginning, go, go check out his YouTube channel. Any particular videos that are some of your favorites? Um, well, it depends on, I mean, the category, I guess, uh, yeah, there's, there's bow building stuff and there's bushcraft stuff, but my favorite videos are the, you know, out either hiking or hunting with the kids, uh, the family type stuff. Um, one of my favorite videos is, uh, has nothing to do with hunting or bow building or anything. It was, uh, my oldest boy and I did a backpacking trip <clears throat> into one of the wilderness areas here in Idaho. And, um, he coy struggles with letting big picture overwhelm him. Like if he wants to accomplish something, um, it's easy for him to get overwhelmed. And on that trip, like it was a hard trip, you know, it was his first big backpacking trip. Uh, we, we backpacked into a, an Alpine Lake, did some fishing and, and, and that type of thing. And, uh, on our way back out of there, you know, we came up and we were sitting on this bluff and we we're looking back across this, you know, misty valleys and and ridges that we had climbed over and i pointed and i said that way over there that's where we just came from and i looked and i asked him 
um, he's probably 10 at the time. I asked him before, before you did that, would you have thought that you could have done that? And he, he, he said, no. And I, I looked back at him and I asked, how did you do that? And he, he put his head down between his knees and he thought for a minute and he looked back up and he said, one step at a time. That's, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm tearing up thinking about that moment. That, that's powerful. Um, so that's, I mean, that's one of my favorite videos. And another one is just like, uh, Finn, my youngest one. Um, he, uh, he ended up killing a pig with a self bow when he was seven, seven years old, spot and stalk on his own. Like I wasn't even there. We were, uh, we were down in South Florida again. We were hunting with, um, Ryan Gill. Who's a, a big primitive guy down there. And I was, fil- I'd killed a pig the day before, so I didn't even have my bow. Um, it was me, Ryan, Finn, and then Vaston Hall, who's in, uh, whose land we were hunting on down there. We got into this group of pigs. I'm filming for Ryan, filming Ryan. So I turned my attention to like getting the shots on him. Finn runs up to me. I had, a, I had one arrow for him, had a broad head on him, on it. I didn't want him walking around with yeah. a, like behind us with a broad head. Hell no. So I like, I hand him his arrow. He runs off. And I turn back my attention to, to Ryan, like five minutes later, he comes running up to me and says, I shot one. I shot one. And I was, I kind of looked at him. I was like, oh, okay. Like, I didn't know, I didn't know what to make of it. Yeah. But I, I asked Vast and who saw it happen. I was like, did he really shoot one? He said, yeah, I watched it run off with the arrow. And, uh, so we got on this blood trail, tracked it for a little ways and he'd killed like it was a big, it was, you know, it wasn't a huge pig, but it was probably 70 or 80 pounds with a 20 pound self bow, had one arrow. I was like, that's, that's pretty freaking Dude, awesome. That's, that's pretty legendary awesome. status. I know. Look out world. Finn's coming. Wow. That was Finn. Yep. Wow. Yeah. We just met him. So he's 10 now. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the hunter. Isn't it funny how it's kind of, you know, I always thought my son would be a hunter. I don't know if he's going to be, honestly. I don't. I thought my daughter would love hunting, maybe, or what? No, she just wants to spend time with me on anything. But at age four, I'm a, how old are you? 42. I would say I'm turning 42 this year. Yeah, I want my kid to hunt, but I actually don't really care if he doesn't ever yeah. want to be a hunter. Then I'm, I'm okay with that. And if you would have asked me that 10 years ago, I'd be like, uh, yeah, my kid's going to hunt. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. But really you don't decide those things. Yeah. You show them as much cool stuff as you can. And I tip my hat to you, man. I'm like kind of jealous that your kids get to spend a month at elk camp living out of the woods, hearing your stories every day and helping mom out. And I mean, they're just gathering so much confidence yep. that's vetted to do anything they want. I mean, yep. that's cool. Yeah, and, right. and Finn will go like he'll actually go hunting with me. You know, some Koi likes to uh, he likes to hike, and there's a lot of geological activity where we're at. So they're always like picking up different rocks, looking for fossils, uh, geodes, and things like that. Um, play in the creek. You know, they like to build boats and float them down the creek and stuff yeah. like that. But you know, it's it's good. It's really nice to have the whole family there. Um, and you know how much of a grind elk season is. It's like the days are long and you're, you know, you get back to camp and I got to admit, it's, it's so nice to have Liz there <laughs> to have dinner ready when I get back. Cause I can eat and then go to bed, get back up the next morning and then do it That's again. That's an advantage. Oh my God, it is. That's a, like a nutritional recovery advantage. It is. Cause when, when, you know, we, we did elk camp, um, just the guys there for a long time and you'd get back, you know, you get out of the woods back to camp and it might be nine 30, maybe 10 o'clock then you got to cook dinner eat you know you're in bed by maybe 10 30 11 and then you're getting up at 4 a.m and you're doing that day after day and i couldn't like i I still even with liz cooking i can't keep the weight on no and i'm not you know right now i'm 160 pounds i'll lose seven eight pounds at elk camp you know over the duration of the time i'm there um but it's it's tough Mm, but it's the best it's, it the mo- it's my favorite thing and i'm excited that you're excited about taking your family on the journey 
Uh, Clay Hayes website is clayhayes.com. I wish somebody has clayhayes.com. Bastard, whoever you are, let's buy that domain back from them. <laughs> they won't sell it to me. Okay. Um, it's Twisted Stave, uh, S T A V E dot com. Uh, but it, I mean, if you just Google my name, it'll come up. Yeah. And then so with all the other stuff, YouTube, Instagram, Instagram, Clay Hayes Hunter. 